One national publication is not very high on Keaton Slovis going into 2023 for BYU football. Might I offer a counterpoint to their point? You are Locked On Cougars, your daily podcast on the BYU Cougars. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everybody? I'm Jake Hatch, your host here on Locked On Cougars, a resident BYU insider. Thank you for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day. Thank you for making us a part of your routine and being an everydayer with us right here on your only daily podcast focused on the BYU Cougars. Uh, as you might have noticed, if you're watching this on YouTube, trim the beard up a little bit. It'll grow back out, but it's summertime. And I went out golfing the other day and I decided, you know what? This ain't it. So it might be something that's more of a seasonal thing if the beard is going to make a return of probably come back during football season and carry us through the winter out here in Utah. But nonetheless, uh, let's dive right in and talk a little bit about what's going on in BYU sports. Earlier this week, uh, ESPN put out their tiers of quarterbacks, all 133 quarterbacks across the FBS ranks, both from the G5 and the Power 5 programs. They went tier by tier for each one of these QB rankings. And if you're a BYU fan, it's not all that enticing if you were to go just simply by their look because at tier 10, as they're calling it, Third or fourth time is the charm. Eight players for five jobs, and BYU's Keaton Slovis is mentioned here. They also mentioned Cincinnati's Emory Jones, FAU's Casey Thompson, Oklahoma State's Alan Bowman, and also J, uh, J, Rice's JT Daniels. And they, as they have mentioned, Daniels and Slovis were teammates at USC in 2019. Since then, they've combined to start for five more schools. Daniels got hurt in 2019 and was replaced by Slovis, who played really well. And then Daniels ultimately transferred to Georgia, where he lost out to Stetson Bennett. Then they mentioned that Slovis got injured in 2021, replaced by Jackson Dart, and Slovis ultimately transferred to Pitt before transferring again to make room for the Panthers' new addition, transfer Jerkovic, uh, Phil Jerkovic who joins the Pitt Panthers this year. Dart also found the door transferring to Ole Miss, where he's now battling two other transfers for the starting job. Dart was replaced by Williams, who transferred from Oklahoma. Then I wanted to win the Heisman. The point of all of this to say, it's a long convoluted mess, is to say that USC basically pulled off one of those scams where you start with a paperclip and end up keep trading up till you own a Ferrari. The, uh, Trade up game. You guys, you guys probably played that growing up, where you go from like neighbor to neighbor and try and uh, it's called bigger or better is the way I played it growing up. But it's kind of a funny thing. But they mentioned this about Keaton Slovis, most notably. Slovis on third and fourth down last season, mind you, he's playing for Pitt in a very non quarterback friendly offense, in my opinion. This. 39 of 79 passing with three touchdowns, four interceptions, 10 sacks, and a 13.3 QB rating, the second worst mark in all of FBS. So that is to say that the numbers do not uh, bode well for Keaton Slovis per ESPN as he takes over at BYU. Now, let me also offer this. Based on my conversations with folks inside the program, they believe that Keaton Slovis is going to rebound more towards what he was doing in 2020 and 2021 at USC versus what he was at the tail end of 2021 as well as when he went to Pitt last year uh, for the Panthers. He said this on this podcast. If you went, if you uh, go back, I, it goes back, I think, a couple of weeks at the end of BYU Spring Ball. I had a chance to talk with him one on one, and he told me this will be the first time I have played for the offensive coordinator that I committed to out of high school and also in the transfer portal process going to Pitt. Let's remind you, he committed to Cliff Kingsbury when Kingsbury was at USC. It felt like for a hot New York minute before he got hired by the Arizona Cardinals. He's the offensive coordinator for USC. They brought in Graham Harrell. That's who uh, Slovis ultimately played played for and he had a pretty good run with Graham Harrell but it was not the OC that he committed to when he was deciding to transfer to Pitt Mark Whipple who had just made Kenny Pickett a first round pick to the Pittsburgh Steelers was looking like okay this is my next guy I'm going to go play for he's going to do the job well the rug got pulled out from Keaton's pulled out from underneath Keaton Slovis's feet once again when Mark Whipple was let go by Pat Narduzzi ultimately it landed at Nebraska and they brought in I don't remember who the offense coordinator uh, Frank uh, Signetti I think is what it was and it was very non non-quarterback uh, specific offense this is more of a run heavy offense is what he was running at Pitt. BYU's coaches truly believe they can get the best out of Keaton Slovis at least or at least they're going to absolutely try to get the best out of him. What I saw during spring ball and all the conversations I had with the folks are practice insiders who 
who fed us information throughout the spring said that he had his moments really like absolutely brilliant. But there's other moments that gave you cause for concern. But the good news is the moments of brilliance where he looked like he was in firm control of BYU's offense, really running things, directing the troops, so to say. He very much looked apart that like he very much looked that type of a part more than he did in terms of being a deer in headlights looking lost in BYU's offense. This is a kid who's come in and really ingratiated himself with his teammates. The guys around him love him. He's worked with John Beck down there at 3D QB. He mentioned that he's going to go and work down there. He's trying to get as many BYU wide receivers and tight ends down to California with him to work out as well. So I, I'm of the opinion that, yeah, they can say that he's tier 10 here and he's uh, down towards the bottom of all FBS starters this year. And maybe ESPN is right, but BYU, everything that they keep saying about him, in my personal opinion, is that Keaton Slovis is going to be in a much better system for his skill set at BYU than he was at Pitt. Uh, the pit thing to me just looks like an abject failure. When Pat Narduzzi is just uh, casting oil on you and uh, lighting it on fire on your way out the door, you know it was a bad situation. I, I don't know what went down between Keaton, Keaton Slovis and Pat Narduzzi, but it just it, it did not work. So best of luck to Phil Jerkovic as he takes over there at Pitt with Pat Narduzzi running things. Maybe the, he's the answer for their offense. I, I think a lot will be told this year. If Keaton Slovis thrives this year at BYU and a guy like Phil Jerkovic, who was actually a dark horse Heisman contender in his own right at Boston College before leaving the Eagles, well, I think a lot can be told about the situation that a quarterback finds himself in after this upcoming season. Now, if Keaton Slovis comes to BYU and falls flat on his face, well, that's going to be vindication for Pat Narduzzi and ESPN here who wrote up this article. Article. But let me reiterate, BYU's coaches, this is not coming just from me. There are people inside the BYU football program who believe very, very highly in a guy like Keaton Slovis's skills and abilities. And that that's the thing about this is it should be something that you're excited for as a Cougar fan, because if he makes good on the bet on himself coming to BYU, believing that the offensive line in front of him that's been retooled can give him the time that protects him and obviously improve on those third and fourth down uh, stats, as we mentioned, which were pretty bad last year. There's no reason to think that he can't be a much better quarterback this year. And if he really achieves what he hopes to achieve, he believes he's an NFL caliber quarterback. I I'll tell you this much. He has an NFL caliber arm when he really is slinging it and it uh, on point. He's got the ability to deliver the deep ball act with accuracy. And honestly, I think it's a better deep ball than Jaron Hall. And Jaron Hall had a pretty good deep ball, folks. I think Zach Wilson maybe had the best deep ball of the three. That's my personal opinion of these three quarterbacks that Aaron Roderick has been not most notably uh, developing during his time at BYU. But Keaton Slovis, when he is slinging it, folks, there, there's not many guys like him out there. So, Excited to see what he's capable of doing. But like I said, my personal opinion and what BYU believes kind of stands in stark contrast to what ESPN is saying here, what Pat Narduzzi said as Keaton Slovis exited that program. But I am more prone to believe a guy like, uh, uh, well, let's put it this way. I'm more prone to believe that Keaton Slovis can work better in BYU's offense because it just seems that his skill set and his in, in terms of his ability to deliver the ball down the field fits better with what BYU likes to do. Think about it. BYU's offense, when it when it's been at its best, has been a lot of balance. But what they do is they take shots down the field. They will set things up. They will run the ball down your throat, and all of a sudden, they'll go, go right over the top on you. And that's what I think a guy like Keaton Slovis is going to thrive doing in this BYU offense. So, We'll see where it ultimately lands and who's right at the end of the season. But interesting to hear ESPN's take, and I figured I, I would I, I dish on that a little bit on today's show. All right, coming up here in just a moment, we're going to talk a little bit more about what's going on in BYU sports uh, with regards to this weekend upcoming. Also, need to take another take an, uh, excuse me, take another look back at some of the games in BYU's 155 game independent uh, schedule. We've looked back at all of them so far. Uh, we're midway through the 2016 season. We'll continue that as we continue on. Right. Right here on Locked On Cougars. Now, first, a word on our friends over at Bird Dogs. Now, you heard me talk about them earlier this week. They're a brand new sponsor with us here on Locked On Cougars and the Locked On Podcast Network. The best part about this is I got a, a, two pairs of shorts from them earlier this week, and I always appreciate them sending me product that I can actually see, feel, wear. And the best part is they look incredible, my friends. Uh, the best part is you can uh, move. That's the best part about it. They're four-way stretch technology. You don't feel like you're being constricted in any way, shape, or form. And the best part is they're versatile. I, I feel like this 
this is a thing I could wear to the golf course, walk right off the golf course to a date night with my wife or walk right into a meeting with a client, that type of a thing. This is the type of gear they've got. Not, they don't only, not only just have shorts, they have pants. They even have, I think, other accessories that you can add to it. And the best part is right now, as a Locked On Cougars listener, if you go to birddogs.com slash Locked On College and use the promo code Locked On College, you'll get one of these. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see it. It's a Bird Dogs Yeti style, style tumbler with every single order. So once again, that's birddogs.com slash Locked On College. Use that promo code Locked On College. You get that free tumbler and enjoy the best shorts out there. I mean this sincerely. They flex, they breathe. They're absolutely awesome. Once again, that's birddogs.com slash Locked On College. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars your first listen of the day, my friends. Thank you for being everydayers with us right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. Now, a couple of notes before we move along here on today's show is that BYU continues to do a lot of work when, when it comes uh, to finding guys in the transfer portal. Now, obviously, it, I'm out on vacation. Some of you know this. Uh, if, you're, if you're watching this, I have not returned from uh, my family vacation quite yet. But I decided earlier this week when I was recording this show, I was like, you know what the thing about this is? I really think BYU, in terms of the transfer portal cycle, has very much done a lot of good things to bolster this offense and bolster the roster overall. Have they done everything they need to do in the transfer portal? No, and there's still work to be done. I still feel like they need a couple of defensive backs. I still think maybe they need another, another linebacker if they can find a guy like that. Maybe another defensive lineman, a defensive tackle type. And potentially, I think, well, not potentially, I know they need to find multiple wide receivers if at all possible. Now, the good news is that with Darius last that are coming into the wide receiving core, BYU has a pretty solid top four of wide receivers. So you don't necessarily need a quote unquote difference maker at wide receiver. Would it be great to have a guy like that come into the program? Absolutely. You always can use an alpha type who has got proven production at the FBS level, but those guys are a diamond. Uh, no, no, they're not a diamond dozen. They're like the, they're kind of the rarity in the transfer portal anymore. And finding them, you're going to have to outbid a number of other programs out there. And I know that sounds so stupid to think you have to outbid them, but Hey, welcome to the world of NIL. So the bigger thing is if BYU can find guys, there's a guy like Chance Morrow, for example, six foot six wide receiver, a former high three star, low four star prospect, depending on where you looked, coming out of high school, had a number of high level offers before he went to Louisville, didn't play at all this past year, but he's hit the transfer portal. And BYU, I think, would be a grand opportunity for him to come in and develop uh, in the offense, but not necessarily have to be relied upon right away. Like I said, he didn't play much at Louisville. So uh, what would you expect him to come in and be BYU's number one guy? No, you wouldn't expect that. I think that Keanu Hill, Chase Roberts, Cody Epps, now that he returns, as well as Darius Lassiter, are more than capable if they stay healthy, with that caveat included there. If they stay healthy, those four are very capable of, of leading the way for BYU at wide receiver. You also have guys like Parker Kingston, who I think is going to be a breakout uh, sensation this year. If he stays healthy, Parker has got all-world speed, folks. He can absolutely burn it. Uh, somebody told me, uh, I guess I can pass this along to you guys, uh, based on spring football measurements, he was the fastest player on BYU's roster in pads. That's, and there, there's a difference between running very fast on the track, which is he's absolutely fantastic on the track. He ran in the 100-meter final as a senior in high school in one of the fastest classes of the 100 meters that Utah, the high school scene, has ever seen. But the more important thing is you put those pads on him, the shoulder pads, everything else, he's got to wear a helmet, and he is still lightning quick. So keep an, eye, keep an eye on a guy like Parker Kingston and his opportunity coming up. So that's why I think the transfer portal at wide receiver, bringing in one or two guys, they may be guys who like a chance more. I'm just using him, him as an example that they come in here and they may not be guys that are going to be necessarily uh right upon right away. And by the time this podcast airs, Chance Morrow may have made a decision. So I, I, I'm i using this uh, knowing full well that the news could change in 24 hours after I record this podcast. But nonetheless, it's kind of the, the risk I'm taking. But the example still holds. BYU can go out into the transfer portal and find guys, like I said, who are not necessarily guys you can rely upon. They're going to walk in day one and be one of your top four wide receivers. But at the same time, can they come in and be maybe wide receiver five, wide receiver six, and bolster that depth chart? Maybe not necessarily play early on in the season, but if it's attrition happens, which is it's prone to do, just simply in college football, that is going to give a guy like that an opportunity to develop at his own pace. And then maybe by midseason when BYU needs to call upon him, he's more readily available and ready to contribute to the BYU football program. That's, I think, the philosophy BYU should take here. Now, obviously, if you can go out and find there's a guy like Zachary Franklin, uh, who's from UTSA. He's had 1,300 yards a year ago, if I recall correctly. Just an absolutely incredible athlete. If you can win a guy like that overall with the transfer portal, fantastic. But I have heard uh, no 
word on any connection between him and BYU. And I would imagine he's going to get all kinds of NIL opportunities and high dollar numbers thrown at him. But the point remains, BYU still has work to do in the transfer portal. But let's also not forget at the same time, I guess my original point here, that BYU's done a lot of good things in the transfer portal. Bringing in Aiden Robbins, Deion Smith at running back, Keaton Slovis via the transfer portal at quarterback. If you want to go to the junior college ranks, I think Jake Retzloff is kind of the next guy up for BYU at quarterback. But more importantly, you brought in A.J. Vongpachan, who I think immediately bolsters BYU's defense and is a rock in the middle of that defense. Jackson Cravens, Isaiah Banya on the defensive line are going to bring very nice things. They played at a high level for Boise State, which is a program that's very much prided itself on having high-level defensive talent come through it. So I just think across the board, and by the way, even the offensive line, they have brought in, I think, four or five guys now across that offensive front, and I think every single one of them have a shout to potentially start this year for BYU. So don't don't lose sight of the fact that BYU has done a lot of good things in the transfer portal this year and kind of get uh, locked in on the fact that they have not gone and found the wide receivers or maybe the defensive backs you would have liked to, them to have found. I know that they would have liked to have had A.J. Carter uh, playing for them at BYU, but he ultimately decided to go to Baylor. Uh, we'll see what happens with that. Does he pan out at Baylor and BYU missed out on a guy? Only time will tell, but BYU has their work cut out for them. But just a reminder one more time. Let's also remember BYU has done a really, really good job in the transfer portal by and large uh, throughout this offseason. And now that we're just over 100 days away from the season starting, I think things are looking fairly good for BYU as we get ready to watch them uh, take on their Big 12 uh, debut coming up here in just a few months' time. All right. Uh, we'll finish up today's show with some notes, as I mentioned, on the weekend ahead in BYU sports, as well as a quick look at a, yet another game in BYU's 155-game history as an FBS program, uh, FBS independent, excuse me, over the past 12 years plus. We'll talk about all of that here in just a moment. First, a word on our friends over at Perry Homes and with, working with us for the past few months. The best part is that whether you're looking for your first home or ready to upgrade to your dream home, Perry Homes has the house for you, my friends. For 50 years, Perry Homes has been Utah's premier home builder with communities throughout the state. They have many communities, home designs, and price points to help meet your needs. They're wet, w- ready and willing to help you guys out, find exactly what you're looking for, and get you on the way to on the road to home ownership. The best part is they got beautiful communities in Davis, Salt Lake, Tooele, and Utah counties along the Wasatch Front. If you want to live in the in that a corridor, or if you want to get down to Red Rock Country, they got multiple communities in Washington County near St. George as well. They are, are offering you 50 unique home designs, ramblers, two stories, townhomes, and everything in between. They can find the right option for you, and they also are offering generous financing incentives through their preferred lender as well. So get to Perryhomes. Excuse me, PerryHomesUtah.com to see what's new in Utah's finest neighborhoods. That's PerryHomesUtah.com to learn more now. For 50 years, Utah has been coming home to Perry Homes. Thank you once again for making Locked On Cougars a part of your day, my friends. If you have not done so already, please subscribe to the show. Whether you're watching it on YouTube, you're listening to it wherever you get your podcast. If you're just checking us out for the first time, please join us every single day. We put out high-quality con- uh, content Excuse me, on a daily basis, 365 days a year. Okay, we take the weekends off sometimes. But nonetheless, we got you covered every single weekday, Monday through Friday, with a nice tidy package that's uh, 20 to 30 minutes. That's what we kind of go, go for to make sure you guys are up to date on the BYU news that you guys need to know about uh, going into your day or maybe finishing your day, regardless of whenever you listen to it. Thank you for your support. All right, uh, final word on today's show is that BYU Women's Volleyball announced their 2023 uh, uh, Big 12 schedule, their first uh, foray in the Big 12 play. It'll be an 18-game schedule. They'll play six opponents uh, home and home. There's actually only one opponent in Big 12 play. BYU is not faced as a volleyball program, speaking of the women's volleyball program, and that would be, if, if I'm not mistaken, it was uh, the Iowa State is who they had not faced. Yeah, it was Iowa State was the only uh, school that they had not faced off against. But funny enough, I learned uh, when I was reading up on this, Oklahoma State is the only school in the Big 12 that does not have a women's volleyball program, which is a little bit of a surprise to me. They will start play, speaking of the Cougars, September 20th, facing off against the Houston Cougars at the Smith Fieldhouse to host Baylor a couple days later in Provo. But a really, really uh, big slate of games. There's some back-to-backs in there against Texas Tech, Iowa State, Kansas State. I think uh, Texas as well as UCF are all back-to-backs and Cincinnati, excuse me. Uh, They're all back-to-backs, but it's a big opportunity for BYU. It's Iowa State, yeah, the first matchup between the two teams will be this year in Big 12 play. But uh, they have had a fantastic run over in Europe, uh, watching them play in Cairo as well in the Middle East. So women's volleyball should have a fun season. The best part is, folks, 
it's getting real. You're seeing the Big 12 schedules coming out. BYU is, uh, let's see, we're around 40 some odd days from them actually entering the Big 12 conference officially on July 1. But nonetheless, it's cool to see these schedules coming out because it means it's getting realer and realer as we get closer. And I know that sounds, that's probably not the right terminology there, but deal with me. You guys know exactly what I'm talking about. It's, it's getting real, my friend. So we're looking forward to that. All right, final note on today's show is a look back at another game in BYU's 2016 seasons. Our recap of all 155 games in BYU football history rolls on here. Uh, this one was a game that BYU returned home after beating the pants off of Mississippi uh, Mississippi State. That's who they faced. After being Michigan State on the road in East Lansing, they returned home riding pretty high and they found themselves in a dogfight at home against the Mississippi State Bulldogs. Now, MSU, if I'm not mistaken, remains the only SEC program to have made a trip uh, to Provo. Uh, no, actually, Tennessee, Tennessee was supposed to make the trip, but they obviously canceled that. Uh, and MSU made their second trip in 2016 to face off against BYU. Now, Mississippi State was not all that great. Nick Fitzgerald in this game, 17 of 36, 214 yards, one touchdown, two interceptions nothing to write home about. Uh, Taysom Hill, though, had a pretty good game himself. 165 yards passing, three touchdowns against one interception. Uh, Jamal Williams had 76 yards rushing in this game, but more importantly, Taysom Hill added another touchdown on the ground as BYU found themselves in an absolute dogfight in this game. It went into overtime. Actually, it was a double overtime, if you recall. Uh, it was a 14-7 deficit for BYU at halftime. The Cougars tacked on a touchdown in the fourth quarter to make it 14-14 going into OT. Both teams traded touchdowns in the first overtime time period and then you will recall Tanner Baldery if I recall correctly was the one yeah he scored the winning touchdown he caught a pass from Taysom Hill from 25 yards out to give BYU the victory and it's just a crazy crazy game uh, for BYU as they won this one uh, on the back of Taysom Hill. Now, I remember this game. I was up in the press box at Lavelle Edwards Stadium watching this, and I'm sitting there I'm like, BYU should not be struggling as hard as they are against this Mississippi State team. They're not as good as some of the other teams BYU has faced this year, but that's kind of the thing that there was a little bit of a letdown effect. After going out to Michigan State, they probably thought, okay, we've fixed things. We're, we're doing well. But BYU found a way to win. That was the most important thing for this game. It was another Power 5 win on their home field over Mississippi State and got BYU back above 500. It was a three-game win streak, and then they would take that into a game the following week against Boise State, and we'll talk about that game as well as a few others on the back end of that 2016 season coming up on our Monday edition of the podcast. So a big thank you once again uh, for joining us here on a Friday, a little bit shorter edition of the podcast, but nonetheless, hope you guys are all doing well out there in Cougar Nation, wherever you are. Thank you for making us your first listen today. And thank you to all of you, the thousands of you, truthfully, uh, who make us part of your routine every single day. We're lovingly referring to you now as everydayers right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. So thank you for your support as always. Until next time, have a great rest of your day. Hope you all are doing well. This has been the Locked On Cougars podcast. See ya.